السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله وسلم وبارك على نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين أما بعد When we analyze and study the Quran one of the things that we will find is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala often repeats certain stories in the Quran there are certain prophets of Allah certain messengers of Allah that are often repeated their story and their name and their mention is often repeated in the Quran and from amongst all of those prophets of Allah that Allah has chosen to mention to us their story in the Quran the single prophet whose story is most mentioned is the prophet Musa alayhi salam in fact if you were to analyze the Quran and analyze the sunnah of our prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam you will often find that the name of Musa alayhi salam occurs and recurs many a time. Many of the pivotal moments in the life of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam and in the revelation of the Quran, they refer back to this single great mighty messenger of Allah, Musa alayhi salam. To give you a quick example, when revelation first descended upon the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam in the cave of Hira, the first time that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam encountered Jibreel alayhi salam. We all know the story that he went back to his wife Khadija radiallahu anha. And he was afraid of what he had just witnessed and seen. Khadija radiallahu anha, she consoled him. And then she took him to her cousin, a man by the name of Waraka ibn Nawfal. And Waraka was a man who was well versed in the scriptures of the Jews and the Christians. A man of scripture a scholar in those texts and when the Prophet وسلم, went and he narrated this incident he told him what took place it is interesting to mention that uh, that Waraka replied and he said indeed this person or this thing that came to you it is the same angel that Allah sent to the Prophet Musa to the Prophet Musa even though as a scholar of the, the scriptures the Bible and the Torah, the Gospel and the Torah, the Prophet Isa alayhi salam is mentioned after the Prophet Musa. He could have said it's the same angel that came to the Prophet Isa. The Prophet Ibrahim alayhi salam, Abraham, is considered to be the father of the Abrahamic faiths. He could have said that's the same angel that came to the Prophet Abraham. But instead he said that this is the angel that Allah sent to Musa. From all of the prophets that he could have chosen. Likewise, in another similar incident, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam on the night journey, the Isra and Mi'raj, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commands him and by extension us, this ummah, with 50 prayers a day and night. Now we know the incident that on each heaven, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam met prophets of Allah. On the final one of those heavens, the seventh heaven, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam encountered the Prophet Ibrahim alayhi salam. And when Allah commanded him with 50 prayers a day and night, he was returning. And as he returned, the prophet that would stop him would be Musa alayhi salam. Musa would be the one to tell him to go back, back and forth, back and forth, until those prayers became five times a day and night. It is often the name of Musa alayhi salam. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam spoke even about the next life, the hereafter. When he spoke about resurrection, he said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, that I saw in a dream that a, person, a prophet will come on the day of judgment with only three followers. And another prophet will come with two followers. And a prophet will come with a single follower. And there will be prophets on the day of judgment who will not have even a single follower. But then I looked towards the horizon and I saw a great expanse of people. So I said, who is this ummah? Whose ummah is this? And they told me that it is the Ummah of Musa alayhi salam. Again, Musa alayhi salam is mentioned. The Prophet told us also, sallallahu alayhi wasallam, that when the trumpet is blown and everyone lays unconscious, the first one to awake will be our Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam. And he said that what I will see when I awake is Musa alayhi salam clinging to the throne of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Musa alayhi salam. Throughout the Quran, throughout the Sunnah, you find the name of this Prophet of Allah, Musa, being mentioned many a time. Why? There are many reasons and wisdoms. 
But from the greatest of those reasons and wisdoms and Allah knows best is because of the parallels that we can draw between the lives, the missions, the challenges and trials that these two great mighty messengers of Allah would face. Musa alayhi salam and the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam. Not only as two prophets of Allah, but even their followers, their disciples, their companions, and their nations as well. For us, there are many lessons. And that is why the story of Musa alayhi salam is repeated many a time in the Quran. In fact, he is one of the very few prophets of Allah who we have more or less a whole life story concerning him found in the book of Allah. From the moment that he was born, more or less until the end of his life, every single stage, Allah has narrated this to us. This is something which is not the norm in the Quran. Often Allah Azza wa Jal only mentions certain parts of their life. Ibrahim, Ismail, Dawood, Sulaiman, Isa, all of these prophets, we have snippets of their lives. The only other prophet that we have this for is Yusuf alayhi salam. His whole story is more or less mentioned. But Musa alayhi salam is one of those prophets that Allah focuses on in the Quran. So what I want to explore before you this morning is the parallels between these two prophets of Allah in the way that they were sent. Not only in the way that they were sent, but how Allah Azza wa Jal prepared for their arrival. Because this is one of the points that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions concerning the life of Musa alayhi salam. How Allah prepared for them to come. And it is a lesson for us because when Allah Azza wa Jal tells us these stories, He is showing us how when it comes to His awliya, when it comes to those people that Allah has favored and chosen and honored, how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protects them and preserves them, makes things easy for them, prepares things for them, even many decades, many years, many generations before they are even born. That is from the care and the love that Allah shows for his awliya. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions in the story of the Prophet Musa alayhi salam, in Surah Al-Qasas, Allah speaks about the birth of the Prophet Musa alayhi salam. And he says, وَأَوْحِيْنَا إِلَىٰ أُمِّ مُوسَىٰ أَنْ أَرْضِعِي we inspired to the mother of Musa alayhi salam that she should suckle her child. It is said in the books of Tafsir, in the books of history, that Pharaoh saw a dream. And in this dream, he saw that his destruction would be upon the hands of one of the children of Israel. One of those children would grow up and his kingdom would be destroyed. It is said in some of those narrations that in his dream he saw a man from amongst Bani Israel wake up and there was fire coming from his mouth. And when he asked for an interpretation of this dream, they told him that it means destruction for you and your kingdom. So Pharaoh became afraid. And he decreed a proclamation, a decree that every single male child of Bani Israel should be killed in childbirth. This is a massacre, genocide. Kill every single male child. So every single day, his soldiers, his army, they would go in the streets of Egypt, and they would go to those houses of Bani Israel, who were slaves. They would go to their houses, and they would search for a newborn male child. And if they found a newborn male child, they would slaughter them. They would kill them. And when this happened, this took place, it lasted for a year, two years, three years, but then the advisors of Pharaoh came to him and they said that we have a problem. If we continue to kill all of the male children, we will have no slaves left. Because the older slaves will grow old and they will die or they will become too infirm and weak to work for us. And you've killed all of their children. Sooner or later we will run out of, a, of this commodity, these slaves that we need for our kingdom. So Pharaoh, he said to them, kill them one year and leave them living one year. Death one year, life one year. So a 50% chance that he would kill this man who would destroy his kingdom. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala at this point decreed that in the year that there was to be no killing, the Prophet Harun alayhi salam was to be born. And in the following year, in which there was to be killing, the Prophet Musa alayhi salam was to be born. And this is the first lesson the first instant, instance in which we see how Allah prepared for the arrival of Musa alayhi salam. Because if Allah had decreed, it could have been the other way around. Musa is born in the year that there is no killing. 
Harun is the one who is born the next year. Or they could have been separated by two years. Harun is born, then two years later, Musa alayhi salam is born. But no, Allah wants to show his power, his love and his divine protection for his awliya. So Musa alayhi salam is born in the year that there is to be killing. And that is where Allah picks up the story in Surah Al-Qasas. The mother of Musa alayhi salam is afraid. She lives in terror. And any person who is a parent who has younger siblings or younger nieces and nephews, imagine the terror and the fear that you would experience, knowing that it is only a matter of days or weeks before that child is going to be killed. They're going to die. There's no trial. There's no relief organization. There's no police. There's nothing to save them. They will die. So she lived in a state of abject fear and terror. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, because she was a woman of Iman, a believing woman, someone who trusted in Allah, Allah inspired to her. وَأَوْحِيْنَا إِلَىٰ أُمِّ مُوسَىٰ أَنْ And we said to the mother of Musa, we inspired to her, that she should continue to suckle her child Musa. فَإِذَا خِفْتِ عَلَيْهِ فَأَلْقِيهِ فِي الْيَمِّ وَلَا تَخَافِي وَلَا تَحْزَنِي and when you fear for him, meaning when the soldiers are approaching the army of Pharaoh, then take him and cast him into the river. And don't fear, nor despair. <inaudible> for verily we will return him to you and make him from amongst the messengers. Look at the wording that Allah chooses in the Quran, the Arabic. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, when you fear for your child, throw him into the river, cast him into the river. In another surah, Surah Taha, Allah Azza wa Jal says the same thing. فَأَلْقِهِ فِي التَّابُوتِ فَقْضِي فِيهِ فِي الْيَمْ فَقْضِي فِيهِ فِي التَّابُوتِ فَقْضِي فِيهِ فِي الْيَمْ Throw him into the basket, throw him into the river. The word that Allah uses in both instances is to throw. Now we as adults, as parents, even if you don't have children, it's common sense. If you have a newborn baby, and you're holding that baby, and you want to place that child down on a bed, on a mattress, on the floor, do you throw the child? If you're holding the child, and someone says to you, and it's their son, their child, they want you to put the child down, do they say, yeah, just go and throw him somewhere over there? Right? He needs to go to sleep, go and throw him into the bed. But Allah Azza wa Jal, the wording he chooses in the Quran is to cast and to throw. And the scholars of Arabic language, of eloquence, they say, that this is to denote the divine protection and care of Allah. Meaning that it doesn't matter how you place him into this basket. Nor does it matter how you place him into the river. Even if you were to throw or to cast him, Allah with his divine protection will care for him. Meaning nothing can harm him. Doesn't matter. Whatever happens, whatever circumstances take place, Allah has already ordained protection for him. So the mother of Musa was inspired. That when those soldiers of Pharaoh would come, she would take her newborn child Musa and she would place him in a basket. She would take that basket to the rear of her property where the river Nile used to run. And she would place the child and the basket into the river. She would tie up the basket. She would come into the house. The soldiers would enter. They would see that there is no child. They would leave and she would return to retrieve her son. That is the plan that she had formulated within her mind. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions this in the Quran. One day as those soldiers of Pharaoh were approaching, they were now entering, ready to come into her house, to search to see if there were any children. Musa alayhi salam, his mother, seeing them approach, she became afraid. She has a plan, she's thought about this, but now that the moment has arrived, it is something which inspires fear within her. It's a normal, natural reaction and emotion to the situation. She is afraid, afraid for herself, afraid for the life of her son. So she takes him in haste. She places him in the basket. She takes him outside. She places him in the river. And then she wants to run back inside to greet the soldiers, to meet them. Because if they see her outside, they will know that she's up to something. They'll search and they'll kill him. So she rushes back into her house. But she forgets to tie up the basket. So she rushes inside. 
The soldiers enter. They come. They find that there is no one there, no child, no son. So they leave. She feels a sense of relief, of happiness. Her plan, Alhamdulillah, has worked. They didn't find the child. So she rushes back outside to retrieve, save her son. But in her haste, she doesn't realize that she forgot to tie up the basket. So she rushes outside and what does she find? A river, but no child, no basket. And she sees that her son has flown down river, down river. And so there, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions in Surah Al-Qasas, وَأَصْبَحَ فُؤَادُ أُمِّ مُوسَى فَارِغًا That the heart of the mother of Musa became empty. Farigh, empty. Meaning that she went from that sense of elation, of hope, of, of relief, that those soldiers didn't find her son, she went all the way to feeling completely empty. Her son has been lost. He's going down the largest river in the world. He's being carried down river. In kadat latubdi bihi, she was about to shout out and expose him. She was about to seek help. Someone go and save my son. Save my child. Retrieve that basket. Lawla arrabatna ala qalbiha litakuna min al mu'minin. Were it not that we made her heart firm and steadfast so that she may be from amongst the believers. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in this verse, He mentions the word heart twice. And also this is from the balagha and the eloquence of the Qur'an, that the word heart is mentioned twice, but in Arabic, two different words are used for it. The word fu'ad and the word qalb. Both of them used in a single verse. Both of them mean the same thing. In English, if you look at the translation, both of them will say heart. But there is a difference in the Arabic between the two. وَأَصْبَحَ فُؤَادُ أُمِّ مُوسَى فَارِغًا That the heart of the mother of Musa became empty. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is speaking about the emotions that she experienced. Fuad in the Arabic speaks about the emotional heart. The emotions that a person experiences. In كَادَتْ لَتُبْدِي بِهِ She was about to call out for help. لَوْلَا أَرَّبَطْنَ عَلَى قَلْبِهَا But we made her heart, her qalb, we made it firm. Why? Because she realized that if she calls out for help, yes, someone may come and save the child, retrieve the basket, but those soldiers who had just left her property, they would be drawn to the same sounds, the same shouting, the same commotion. And they would find him and they would kill him anyway. They would kill him anyway. So instead, she let him go, trusting in Allah, being pleased with the decree of Allah. So Allah says that we made her heart firm using the word qalb. And qalb in the Arabic language means the heart that is tempered with the rational mind. The heart that is thinking. And that's why Allah Azza wa Jal, when He speaks in the Qur'an about contemplating the Qur'an, He uses the word qalb. أَفَلَا يَتَدَبَّرُونَ الْقُرْآنَ أَمْ عَلَى قُلُوبٍ أَقْفَالُهَا Do they not contemplate the Qur'an or are their hearts sealed and locked? Because to contemplate doesn't, doesn't just mean to have emotions with the Qur'an, it means to use your mind, to think, to ponder, to reflect, to draw lessons from it. So Allah Azza wa Jal mentions that she was someone who realized in that instant that it was better to let him go and trust in Allah. So that's what she did. She let Musa alayhi salam carry on down river. And he carried on down river and from all of the places that he would arrive at, from all of the houses in Egypt that he would stop at, he stops at the palace of Pharaoh. And Pharaoh takes him or his wife takes him and they make him a son. They adopt him. Even though he had seen a dream, even though he had seen a dream that Musa, or that a man from Bani Israel would destroy him and his kingdom. And now he has a child that he recognizes is not an Egyptian. He's from Bani Israel, but he will adopt him as a son. Such is the power, the care, the love of Allah. That when this child, and a child, a baby is helpless, defenseless, can't speak, can't defend himself, can't fight, can't do anything, can't even eat and drink of his own accord do anything. But when such a child comes 
are in front of the greatest tyrant and oppressor to have ever lived, that tyrant is unable to do anything. That tyrant instead takes him as a son, cares for him, nurtures him, educates him. He grows up as if he is a prince of Egypt. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is showing his power, his care, his protection. That even before Musa alayhi salam would become a prophet of Allah, even before many years before he would become a messenger of Allah, in fact, even before he was born, that dream of Pharaoh was already preparing for the arrival of Musa alayhi salam. Such is the care of Allah for those people that he loves. Such is the divine protection of Allah for his awliya. That is the story of Musa alayhi salam. We have in the books of Sirah, in the books of history, also the coming of our Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam. And these narrations, as you understand, are not necessarily all authentic because the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam never mentioned them himself, but they are mentioned in the books of history and in the books of Sirah. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam before he was born, in fact, before even his father was born, in the time of his grandfather, Abdul Muttalib, Abdul Muttalib was the leader of Quraysh. And the people of Quraysh, for many generations, they had lost the wow of Zamzam. The Kaaba in those days was the Kaaba as we know it today. And around it was sand. There was no Masjid al-Haram. There was no marble, none of that stuff. It was just literally sand. And they had lost the wow of Zamzam. It is mentioned in some of those narrations that many, many generations before, you had a tribe, and that tribe when it was expelled, as a way of vengeance, because they were afraid of being expelled from Mecca, they hid Zamzam, they buried it. They d put sand on it and they buried it, and then they were expelled from Mecca. They would eventually return, that same tribe would eventually return to Mecca and they would become the custodians of Mecca again. But so many years had passed that they forgot where they had buried the well of Zamzam. For many years, many generations that continued. Abdul Muttalib one day he saw a dream. A man came to him and in poetry he mentioned to him the location of Zamzam. But the poetry was so vague that he didn't understand. The second night he saw a similar dream. A man came to him in poetry. He mentioned to him the well of Zamzam. Gave him more information but still not enough. The third consecutive night he saw a dream. A man came. He gave him more poetry. This time enough for him to search. The next morning he woke up. Three, four sons at the time, he woke them up and he told them, let's go, let's dig in the middle of the desert. He entered with his sons into that Haram area, that Kaaba vicinity. And you can imagine the other leaders of Quraysh were there because that was the place that they would congregate. That was the place that they would meet and sit. And he begins to dig in the desert. The leaders of Quraysh say, Abdul Muttalib, what are you doing? Why are you digging in the desert? Abdul Muttalib says, because I am searching for Zamzam. I am looking for Zamzam. These people think he's gone crazy. This old man has become senile. Who digs for water in the middle of the desert? And Zamzam has been lost for generations. Now just randomly he's digging. So they begin to ridicule and mock him. Make fun of him. But Abdul Muttalib ignores them and he digs. And his sons dig. They dig and they dig and they dig and eventually they find water. And that water gushes out and it becomes a spring. They have discovered the well of Zamzam. The people of Mecca begin to rejoice. They become happy because even though Zamzam has been lost, they understand Zamzam. Zamzam is something honorable to them. It's something that they used to covet, something that they heard stories of from their fathers and grandfathers and so on. So now they rejoice. And they say to Abdul Muttalib, oh Abdul Muttalib, we have found Zamzam. We have found Zamzam. Abdul Muttalib says to them, no, I found Zamzam. You were ridiculing me, mocking me, making fun of me just moments ago. Now you claim to have found Zamzam. No, Zamzam belongs to me, my family, my children. We are the custodians of Zamzam. They disputed. They said, no. You have no right to Zamzam. Zamzam belongs to all of Quraysh, all of Mecca. What right do you have over Zamzam? So they had a dispute. They decided that the only way to settle this dispute was that they would travel to a fortune teller. This woman in Syria, 
that the Arabs used to go to when they would have big disputes and she would cast her runes or her dyes or whatever she would do and she would tell them how to arbitrate in their issues. So they left. From Mecca to Syria is a month's journey in the desert heat and sun. So they left together. The leaders of Quraysh, the nobility of Quraysh, they even took their children and their sons with them to show how important this issue was. This is a major issue. All of them travel. They have their supplies, their water, their food, and they're traveling in the middle of the desert. As they're traveling, halfway there, they begin to lose their rations. Their rations, their supplies are finishing, but they're in the middle of a desert. There's no water, there's no food, there's no people, there's no nearby towns. It's not like today where you have service stations and places where you can just pull in. They have nothing. So now they lose everything. Everything finishes, their water, their food, and they're in the middle of the desert heat, the sun. So they're fatigued, they're thirsty, they're dehydrated. So the people of Quraysh began to just sit down and lie down, giving up hope, thinking that we're about to die. Everything, all of this journey has been for nothing. Abdul Muttalib, his children are in the same exact same, same exact situation, experiencing the same things. But Abdul Muttalib says to his sons that if we're going to die, we may as well die digging for water, searching for water. We're going to die anyway. We may as well die searching for water. So they split up and they begin to search, dig, dig, dig. And after a while, one of them finds water. So Abdul Muttalib calls his sons, they gather, they drink from this water, they replenish their supplies, and then he says to his sons, go and call Quraysh, tell them all to come, we found water. So they come, they drink from that water, they replenish their supplies, they carry the water that they need, and then Abdul Muttalib says, now let us go. Let us carry on, let's go to Syria. The Quraysh say to him, no. The one that gave you water here, O Abdul Muttalib, is the same one who allowed you to find water in Mecca. Meaning just as Allah gave you water here, He decreed that you would have found that water in Mecca, Zamzam belongs to you and your family. And that's why the tribe, the family, the clan of the Prophet wasallam, their duty or their responsibility, especially in the times of Hajj pilgrimage, was that they were the custodians of Zamzam. They would water the pilgrims. They said, Zamzam is for you. You keep it. You can be custodians of Zamzam. Abdul Muttalib became so happy, so elated. He was so happy that he said, By Allah, if Allah ever gives me 10 sons, I will slaughter number 10. Sacrifice him as an offering to Allah. Now obviously this is many years before Islam. Those people had their own practices, their own ideas, their own way of doing things. Abdul Muttalib at the time had three, four, five sons. Perhaps he never even thought that he would get to ten anyway. If I have ten sons, I will sacrifice number ten. They go back to Mecca, things continue, years pass. Number five comes, number six comes, number seven, eight, nine, and then he has number ten. Who is number 10? Who is number 10? Come on guys, this is like so obvious. It is Abdullah, the father of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam. And look again how Allah is preparing for whose arrival? For our Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam. If Allah had decreed Abdullah could have been number 6, number 7, number 8, number 10, number 9, sorry, maybe even 11, 12 if he was going to have more, could have been any number. But Allah decreed that he would be number 10. Abdullah is born, number 10. A year passes, two, three years pass. Abdullah is now a toddler. Young boy, just barely walking, speaking. And as you know, for those of you that have younger children within your families, that is probably one of the most cutest and nicest ages of children, when they can just begin to walk and talk. That is a very nice age of a child. Abdul Muttalib one day, at this age, he takes his son Abdullah by the hand, he takes a knife, and he begins to walk. And as he's walking, he passes by the Kaaba, and one of the people of Quraysh are sitting there, the leaders, the nobility, the leaders of the different clans of Quraysh, and they see Abdul Muttalib walking with his son and a knife. 
So they say, Abdul Muttalib, where are you going? What are you doing? So Abdul Muttalib says, I'm going to sacrifice my son Abdullah. They say, why? That's crazy. He says, don't you remember I made an oath when Allah gave me Zamzam, that if Allah gave me 10 sons, I would sacrifice number 10. And the Quraysh, for all of their evil and everything else that they had, one thing that they would never do is break an oath that was invoked by the name of Allah. They considered it to be sacred. The name of Allah was so sacred that if they used that name in an oath, they would fulfill that oath. Doesn't matter how crazy the oath may have been. I am going to kill the son of mine, Abdullah. Sacrifice him for Allah. The people of Quraysh said, that's crazy. You can't kill your son. Because if you kill your son as the leader of Quraysh, it will become a practice for all of Quraysh. People will just start making oaths. If Allah, you give me this, I'll sacrifice a son. Oh Allah, if you do this, I'll sacrifice. You can't just start doing this because it will become a practice for all of Quraysh, perhaps even the Arabs, and they will start to sacrifice their sons left, right, and center. Don't do this. Abdul Muttalib said, I made an oath to Allah. I have no other choice. There's no option. There's no get out clause. I must do this. They said to him, why don't we go back to that woman in Syria? Let her decide. Ask her, perhaps there is something else that you can do. Abdul Muttalib obviously doesn't want to sacrifice his son, doesn't really want to kill his son if he doesn't have to, but he doesn't see a choice. And it is said in some of those narrations that Abdullah was the most beloved of the sons of Abdul Muttalib. So he agreed to go back to Syria. They go back to Syria. They eventually reach this woman, and the woman says to Abdul Muttalib that you must draw lots. Draw lots. If you draw the lot of your son, Abdullah, you must sacrifice 10 camels. And every time you draw his name, you sacrifice another 10 camels until you draw the lot of the camels. And that's where you stop. So he agreed. They went back to Mecca. And he begins to draw lots. The first lot, Abdullah, 10 camels. The second lot, Abdullah, another 10 camels. The third lot, Abdullah, another 10 camels. And he draws it 10 times, meaning that he has a total of? Math is not a strong point in New Jersey. He draws 100 camels. 100 camels that he must slaughter. 100 camels. And then he eventually draws the lot of the camels. So he sacrifices 100 camels in place of his son. Now today this may seem like 100 camels, big deal, right? It's just like 100 camels. However, camels amongst the Arabs were the most precious type of wealth. And that's why you find in the Sunnah that the Prophet ﷺ, when he would speak about something, try to quantify it for his companions, for the Arabs, he would mention camels. That if Allah guides by you a single person, it is better for you than red camels. The best type of camels that the Arabs possessed. A camel in that time was like a Rolls Royce or a Bentley. Imagine having to buy a hundred Bentleys to sacrifice instead of sacrificing some, some child. A hundred Bentleys. A hundred camels he had to find. So he took a hundred camels and he slaughtered them instead of his son. That son, Abdullah, would grow up, he would become a man. He would marry a woman by the name of Amina. And both of them would have a child who would be none other than our Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa Look at how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala prepared for the coming of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Not just by a year, not just by two years. It's not like the story of Musa where it's just before he was even born, generations before. Before his father is even born, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is preparing for the coming of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Such is the love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for the prophets that he has. Such is the blessings that Allah azza wa jal gives to his awliya. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala through his divine care, through his divine protection is showing people how much he loves them. And at the top of that list are the prophets and messengers of Allah. 
When the Prophet وسلم, eventually becomes a Prophet of Allah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions in the Quran all of these stories to the Prophet وسلم, And the Prophet وسلم, sees the parallels between himself and those Prophets of Allah. How Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala prepares for them. But when it comes to me and you, we are not Prophets of Allah, we are not messengers of Allah, but even so the stories of Musa alayhi salam, the story of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam, these stories, we too can draw parallels and lessons from them. If you reach that level of Iman, if you reach that heightened state of Iman, if your connection to Allah, your relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is so strong, it is so firm, that everything you do, you do for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. As the scholars of the past used to say, that a sign of iman and taqwa is that before you say a single thing or you perform a single action, you stop and you ask yourself, is what I am doing or what, what I am about to do, is it something which pleases Allah or is it something which displeases Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? And once you answer that question, that is when you then carry on and do that action or don't do that action. Say those words or don't say those words. Imam Malik rahimahullah ta'ala, he used to be asked questions. He was a scholar of Islam. People used to come to him for fatwa. And he would give fatwa. But one day when he answered the question, the person there said to him, I don't like your answer. I don't agree. Does it make sense to me? Surely there's a difference of opinion, right? You hear that all the time, right? Surely there must be another opinion. There must be some scholar who gave a different view. Imam Malik said to him, by Allah, no one ever asks me a question except that I pause and I ask myself the answer that I'm about to give. Will it bring me closer to paradise or will it bring me closer to the fire? And once I answer this question to myself, then I speak to you. That's how I answer. This is what goes on inside of me before I speak about the religion of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That is how the great scholars of Islam used to be. A person traveled all the way from southern Spain, Andalus, the area all the way to Medina, to meet the greatest scholar of the time, Imam Malik. And his people had gathered money and supplies for him to travel because they had 40 questions. 40 questions that they needed answers for pressing issues. And this is the greatest scholar in all of the Muslim world of that time. He comes, this man, traveling for many, many miles, months of journey, arrives in Medina, comes to Imam Malik and asks him 40 questions. Imam Malik answers four, some narrations five, some narrations six. So he answers. For the rest, 34, 35, 36, he says, I don't know. I don't know. The man says, I came from Andalus, from southern Spain, in the Muslim empire that was the furthest reaches of the world. That's as far as they knew the world existed. I've come from that far to you because you are the greatest scholar of our time. My people gathered money, supplies for me to come to ask you 40 questions and you're saying for the vast majority, I don't even know. What do I say to my people when I return? He said, you will go back to your people and you will tell them that Malik said he doesn't know. That's what you will say. Malik said he doesn't know. This is how the scholars of Islam were. When you have that heightened level of Iman, that connection with Allah, that state of taqwa, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala blesses you with his divine love and care and protection. That is the lesson that we take. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala plans and preordains and decrees things for you. That sometimes when they take place, you don't understand them. You don't appreciate them. They may even be things that to you on the surface, they harm you. Things that you don't like. Things that you don't want. Things that you would rather not have. But Allah in His infinite knowledge and wisdom knows that this is best for you. That is from the divine care and protection of Allah. Because when Allah saved Musa from the jaws of Pharaoh, from his own hands, and even though he was there for many years, Pharaoh wasn't able to raise a single finger against this man who would eventually go and destroy him and his kingdom. Because Allah's protection was with him. Allah wants to show Musa, look at the care and love I have for you. 
the Prophet وسلم, many occasions before the Prophethood, after the Prophethood. The Prophet وسلم, as the companions used to say, was the most courageous of all of us. He was the most courageous, the most brave, because he knew that nothing would happen except by the permission of Allah. That Allah's divine care and protection was greater and stronger for him than anything that all of the armies of the world could come and offer him protection for. Nothing else can rival that protection of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The companions used to say at night, sometimes you would awake because we would hear a sound, some disturbance in Medina. So we would get ready and we would go out two, three, four at a time together to see what was going on. And we would find that the Prophet ﷺ was returning. On his way back and he would say, it's okay, nothing happened. Go back to bed, go to sleep, go home. He would just be out there. Because the Prophet ﷺ knew the love that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had for him. The divine protection that Allah gave for him. This is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does by extension, not only for his prophets, for his messengers, but he does it for all of his awliya. For all of those people that attach themselves to the religion of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam mentions these stories so that we can draw lessons and parables from them. That we may apply them within our own lives. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will give you his divine care and protection and love if you are from the awliya of Allah. If you work hard day and night to reach that level of iman, you strive against yourself, against the whisperings of shaitan, against the temptations of your nafs for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. As Allah says in the Quran, Ala inna awliya Allahi, la khawfun alayhim wa la hum yahzanun. Indeed, the awliya of Allah, for them there will be neither fear, nor will they despair. الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا وَكَانُوا يَتَّقُونَ They are those who have iman, belief in Allah, and they used to have taqwa, fear of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. لَهُمُ الْبُشْرَى فِي الْحَيَاةِ الدُّنْيَا وَفِي الْآخِرَةِ For them will be glad tidings in this life. And glad tidings in the next life. May Allah Azza wa Jalla make us from amongst His awliya. Subhana Rabbi Karabil Azzati Amma Yasifun. Wa Salaamu Alaikum Salim. Wa Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen. Wa Sallallahu Alaihi Nabiya Muhammad. Wa Ala Alihi Wa Sahbihi Ajma'in. Wa Salaamu Alaikum Wa Rahmatullahi Wa Barakatuh. أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم طاسم تلك آيات الكتاب المبين نتلو عليك من نبأ موسى وفرعون بالحق لقوم يؤمنون إِنَّ فِرْعَوْنَ عَلَا فِي الْأَرْضِ وَجَعَلَ أَهْلَهَا شِيعًا يَسْتَضْعِفُ طَائِفَةً مِّنْهُمْ يَسْتَضْعِفُ طَائِفَةً مِّنْهُمْ يُذَبِّحُ أَبْنَاءَهُمْ وَيَسْتَحْيِي نِسَاءَهُمْ إِنَّهُ كَانَ مِنَ الْمُفْسِدِينَ ونريد أن نمن على الذين استضعفوا في الأرض ونجعلهم ونجعلهم أئمة ونجعلهم الوارثين ونمكن لهم في الأرض ونري فرعون وهامان وجنودهما منهم ونري فرعون وهامان وجنودهما منهم ما كانوا يحذرون وأوحينا إلى أم موسى أن أرضعيه فإذا خفت عليه فألقيه في اليم ولا تخافي ولا تحزني إنا را ردوه إليك وجاعلوه من المرسلين فالتقطه آل فرعون ليكون لهم عدوا وحزنا إن فرعون وهامان وجنودهما كانوا خاطئين 
وقالت امرأة فرعون قرة عين لي ولك لا تقتلوه عسى أن ينفعنا أو نتخذه ولدا أو نتخذه ولدا وهم لا يشعرون وأصبح فؤاد أم موسى فارغا إن كادت لتبدي به لولا أن على قلبها لولا أن على قلبها لتكون من المؤمنين وقالت لأخته قصيه فبصرت به عن جنب وهم لا يشعرون وحرمنا عليه المراضع من قبل فقالت هل أدلكم فقالت هل أدلكم على أهل بيت يكفلونه لكم يكفلونه لكم وهم له ناصحون فرددناه إلى أمه كي تقر عينها ولا تحزن ولتعلم أن وعد الله حق ولكن أكثرهم ولكن أكثرهم لا يعلمون